So I was thinking of this whole idea of like the big man, the Superman coming to save us when I was watching this story unfold with Elon Musk and Twitter. And I don't want anything I say to be taken as an attack on Musk. That's not at all what I'm saying. I admire him a lot. I think he's a really interesting character, really interesting thoughts. Some of the things that he says, talks about, are actually, uh, you know, he comes at things in, in this sideways way that I really like. It really illuminates uh, the problems in the world and the way the world is going. Uh, so he, he s- sneaks up on Twitter. Uh, hilarious. He he buys, I think, 9% of the shares, which makes him the, the major stockholder uh, to keep him away from their plan to, to silence everybody they disagree with, which is what they've been doing. I mean, they just continually cut down anything that smacks of conservatism. Uh, you know, he, he refuses. They try to put him on the board where they can control him and keep him quiet. And he says, no, I, you know what? I'm not going to go on the board. I'm going to buy that place. Uh, now, they panic. Twitter panics. And they're doing everything they can to stop uh, Elon Musk from buying Twitter. And it's hilarious. You know, they've got these all these kind of, you know, business things that are actually boring, but they give them fun names so they sound like they're more exciting. Like a, they put a poison pill in there. And so it's, all, it's all just money. They're just <laughs> It's not that interesting. They're trying to keep Musk from buying it out. And Musk has got the money. He's got like $46.5 billion in funding to purchase Twitter, which I think will be a large improvement on the shareholder stock. So in other words, shareholders will have a lot of reason uh, to, to sell their stock to Elon Musk if he's buying it up for that kind of money. And they're terrified because they have gone on this mission of shutting down conservative speech. And they keep pretending that's not happening. They don't even really pretend it anymore. It's been exposed by Project Veritas. We know they're doing it. Uh, Dan Gaynor from our wonderful uh, friends at Media Research Center, uh, he was on Tucker. He was talking about this. Here's Dan. Well, what we found is, the, obviously, one of the big categories was the Hunter Biden story. You know, uh, you're talking about major players being censored. Uh, the, obviously, the President Trump, Don Trump Jr., Kevin McCarthy, Ted Cruz. You go down the line, major publications. And that wasn't even the only category. We found more than 230 examples of people being censored for creepy Joe Biden stories. Uh, you know, the, that's the shows how far big tech will go to protect their president. I mean, if you cut out everybody who thinks Joe Biden is creepy, Twitter would just go silent. But but here's the thing. Twitter, whatever commitment to free speech Twitter might have once had, uh, it's gone. I think, you know, that uh, Jack Dorsey, I used to make fun of him as Jack Boots Dorsey. Uh, but I think that he was caught between his own kind of libertarian instincts, kind of grand uh, cosmic libertarian instincts, uh, the pressure he was under from D.C. Democrats, and I think a bit of Trump derangement syndrome. He actually thought Trump was like a monster. Uh, but you know, I think that what, what Dorsey would have ultimately done was he wanted to release the algorithm to the world. He wanted to set the algorithm free so that anybody with any kind of, um, you know, uh, computer knowledge co- could basically create their own Twitter. You could create a Twitter where there were no conservatives, no leftists, whatever you wanted, instead of letting just these kind of overlords do it. But he left and he was replaced by Parag Agrawal, who is just a fascist. I mean, he's not, I shouldn't call him a fascist. He's probably a leftist. He's not a fascist. There are all kinds of bad authoritarian people. And whatever he is, he's one of them. This is, this is what Agrawal said. He said, uh, our role is not to be bound by the First Amendment, but our role is to serve a healthy public conversation, and our moves are reflective of things that we believe lead to a healthier public conversation. The kinds of things that we do about this is focus less on thinking about free speech, but thinking about how the times have changed. He had it. So in other words, they are going to make sure that everybody who speaks is in line with how the times have changed, which is how they say they've changed, and you can only say they've changed the way they say because they say they've changed and they're the ones who control what you say, right? So it's all about these guys. It's not going to be a conversation between you and me. It's not going to be a conversation between you and your 200,000 friends or whatever. It's going to be a conversation controlled by big tech because they know, they know what we're supposed to be talking about. This is authoritarian end of this kind of postmodern idea that speech is a weapon and it's only speech is a construct of power and all differences between us are just constructs of power and truth itself is a construct of power, and they're going to be in control of the truth because they don't want anybody with power. This This is the thing. This is the wild thing about this. They think, well, we don't want anybody with power exercising power like white men or anything like that, so we're going to do it, right? And you get this hilarious, uh, 
first of all, they've shut down actual truth telling. So, I mean, men and women are different. Uh, you can't change your gender. Uh, China is likely responsible for the Chinese virus. Hunter Biden looks corrupt and may have involved Joe Biden in his corruption. Climate change is not an existential emergency. Vaccines are not as effective as we hoped they would be. Uh, all of these things are true. These are literal truths. And you can't say them on Twitter. You can get uh, penalized on Twitter because there's no such thing as truth. It's just power. Power. They're just power structures. And it, what is amazing to me about this is they think Elon Musk is a danger because he's a billionaire. And who starts attacking them, right? Who starts attacking them? All the p most powerful people in the country. Max Boot of Trump derangement syndrome fatality. Uh, he tweeted, I am frightened by the impact on society and politics. If Elon Musk acquires Twitter, he seems to believe that on social media, anything goes. For democracy to survive, we need more content moderation, not less. This is where this theory always leads. Uh, you know, we need less free speech if we're going to have free speech. I, I always love it when they say, if Donald Trump wins another term, it'll be the end of democracy. You think, wait, that actually is democracy if he wins another term. So democracy is, destroys democracy, free speech destroys free speech, because speech is power and truth is power. It's all this kind of power idea. But Max Boot is writing in the Washington Post, which uh, is owned by Jeff Bezos, one of the richest people in the country, only a little less rich, I think, than Elon Musk. All of these people, I mean, this this was all across all across the, uh, the mediaverse, uh, you know, the a journalist at the, the Atlantic. The Atlantic was attacking Musk for this, and the Atlantic is owned by the billionaire widow of Steve Jobs, Time Magazine, uh, which is owned by Mark B Bainoff of Salesforce, also a billionaire. All of these billionaires, because they see themselves, they constantly reconstruct themselves as victims. And you saw this in another attack on, on a, an actual victim in the Washington Post, this woman, Taylor Lorenz, who is really a study in leftist self-deceit, uh, she decides that she, it's so terrible. Whenever she tells the truth, whenever she speaks, people attack her online, and she starts crying about it. cut one. You feel like any little piece of information that gets out on you will be used by the worst people on the internet to destroy your life. And it's so isolating. And terrifying. It's horrifying. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's it's overwhelming. It's really hard. They're great. They just get better every time, those leftist tears. They just get tastier and tastier. It's like wine. You know, the older they get, they just get really... So she's the victim. She's working for Jeff Bezos, Washington Post. And what is she writing about? She says, any little piece of information I put out there. The piece of information she then puts out there is an attack on libs of TikTok, one of our favorite sites uh, on Twitter. She writes an article. Same woman, the woman you just saw crying for herself. She says, meet the woman behind libs of TikTok. This is the headline. Secretly fueling the rights outrage machine. <laughs> so she's on Twitter. She's on Twitter, and she's secretly fueling. The, I don't under, even know what that means. I can't even. You can't even make a joke about that. Is secretly fueling the rights outrage machine in public. She's secretly doing it in public. And then, then the uh, subhead goes on. A popular Twitter account has morphed into a social media phenomenon, spreading anti-LGBTQ plus sentiment and shaping. Public discourse. You don't want independent people shaping. Only Jeff Bezos gets to shape public discourse, my friends. Now, just, just think about this for a minute. Libs of, let me read a little bit. Libs of tech, TikTok reposts a steady stream of TikTok videos and social media posts, primarily from LGBTQ plus people, often including incendiary framing designed to generate outrage. Okay. So in other words, she's spurring hatred against LGBTQ people by posting videos of LGBTQ people putting forward their LGBTQ philosophy. That's what she's doing. She is telling not just the truth, not just the truth as she sees it. She is posting the video of the truth. Here is just an example. We love these people, so we're going to play the, uh, uh, L the Libs of TikTok video. Here's just an example. Here is Madison Cawthorn's definition of a woman. X chromosomes, no tallywhacker. And this gives me a chance to talk about biological essentialism. <laughs> um, first of all, it's not true. People have all kinds of chromosomes and all kinds of bodies. Women who've had hysterectomies, people born with certain conditions, but that's almost immaterial. Number two, it is a system of oppression. Gender is a hierarchy 
and a system of oppression. And the easier it is to define gender, the easier it is to keep the oppression going. It's dangerous. So I, if you can't, if you're not watching this, I mean, the guy's in a dress with a beard. He's like, that looks like a r comedy routine. Um, you know, I, I just want to point out that what this guy is saying is not uh, out there. It, this is a typical theory of most liberal college professors, this is this postmodern, post-postmodern uh, social justice theory that all truth constructs, all uh, ideas of the way society works, all universal truths, all language itself is, uh, is a construct of power. So the idea that men and women are different and they are defined by their bodies is, not, is an evil plot put forward by white people. You saw, I don't know if you saw it online, some guy yelling at the Shapiro at one of his college appearances saying, you know, this is just, just white men think that there's such a thing as gender. Because, you know, you go to Africa where there are black people, there are no genders, obviously. It's, it's a complete nonsense theory, but it's taken over the academy and therefore the left, just as Freudianism did in the 50s and 60s. So Libs of TikTok, they dox the lady who, who runs Libs of TikTok, who likes to stay anonymous because she doesn't want to get death threats because that's what the left is into uh, because they're standing up against the power all the time. So they kill people or threaten people uh, who have no power. So now this poor woman is in hiding. They dox her. They take the doxing out. They put it in the memory hole. And then the editor of the Washington Post says, we never doxed her. Never happened. No, 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 no. Just not. Now, I could say the Washington Post lies, but that's just like saying the Washington Post twice. Uh, so so I understand why the right is hoping Elon Musk, Musk will take over Twitter. And I understand why when these people are um, attacking from these these media outlets that were formed by billionaires, that are run by billionaires for the sake of billionaires, for the globalized uh, you know, network of billionaires. I understand why everybody looks to Elon Musk and says, please take over Twitter and you know, please let people speak again. But that's not what I want to happen, have happen. I mean, I hope he does too. I hope it happens. That's fine. But that's not how I want this problem solved. We have a system here where we elect people who represent us. They represent the people. They serve the people. They forget it, but that's what they're there to do. They gave, that government gave Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and Google, they gave them this power. They gave them the power to edit without being responsible for content, right? That's that section 230 that they talk about. Government gave it to him. So when David French or anybody else comes and says, government can't take away that power, it's just like with Disneyland. You know, government gave them that uh, place where they can run their own show. Government can take it away. Those are not rights given by God. This is These are not rights given by God. Twitter's uh, ability to censor people without being responsible for content is given by government, not by God. Only one of these things, it's an issue, is given by God, free speech. Our free speech, not just Disney's, not just Elon Musk's, not just Twitter's, ours, because we're the ones who count. We're the ones who matter. We're the ones who, the, who built the country and who the country is for. And the power to censor speech was given by the government and can be taken away, but speech and free speech was given by God and it belongs to each one of us. And this is why I'm so eager to see Roe v. Wade overturned so that people can start to build their own cultures in their own states. And I said this before, the Civil War, uh, slavery, soiled the idea of states' rights because slavery was evil. And when the people who defended states' rights were defending slavery, and that soiled the good idea of states' rights. Now, abortion, which is also an evil, abortion has soiled the idea of a powerful federal government. If we can take it back from there and reestablish cultural federal federalism, the real Benedictine option, then we can get back to solving our problems, not by giants fighting in the sky, but by giants fighting on the ground, namely us. If you love the content here, and you know you do, like and subscribe and subscribe to the Andrew Clavin Podcast.